Okay, thank you uh, very much. Uh, thanks to Thermo Fisher for in, uh, inviting me to speak. I'll, um, I'll try not to refer to AFI. It's old habits die hard in this area, but uh, yeah, we'll see how I go. Uh, I'm gonna, we're going to move from four-legged beasts to, to zero-legged. Um, I'm going to talk about fish. So, <coughs> yes, Atlantic salmon. Many of you will recognise Atlantic salmon from the uh, perspective of the dinner plate. Um, as a pretty tasty product. It can be enjoyed in many different ways. Um, obviously, for, for, for myself, working with farming salmon and breeding salmon, we are, of course, looking at it from the, the previous step before it ends up on your plate. Um, I thought I'd spend a little bit of time just introducing um, salmon farming, marine harvest, who we are, what we do, why we run a breeding program. Because um, I think, I guess the majority of the audience here is probably coming from the livestock area and uh, maybe farming Atlantic salmon is not something everyone knows too much about. So to put things in context a little bit, salmon farming. Well, we are a, kind of the minority here, the, the salmon people, but I think we can be kind of justifiably proud of our species in a way. Um, it's not as big as, as of course, the, the livestock species in terms of production, but still um, is a significant... Uh, amount of production of, 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 of farm salmon now in the world. Um, it's, it's a very um, effective species in a way to farm. The yield is around 68, 70% in terms of how much edible product you get off the total body weight. It compares very well to livestock species. And I think the one that, um, that is, is most significant uh, in terms of, of, of farming of a species like salmon is the the feed conversion ratio, which is very good. Um, these figures here are 1.3. I've seen it even lower than that, 1.2, 1.1 uh, even. So it's, it's a very efficient species to farm in many ways. And we work, of course, farming salmon within the natural biology of the species. And the natural biology of the species of salmon is a little bit complex. Um, the fish, of course, start off in in freshwater and they hatch in rivers and then the fish uh, after a period of time go through a process of adaptation called smultification where they prepare themselves to go out to sea in salt water. Uh, they move out to sea, they grow for a period of time in sea that can range from one year to, to many, many years and, and then eventually they return as adults to spawn back in the rivers again. And of course when we farm salmon we have to, to mimic this natural, um, this natural process. So in terms of farming salmon, well, how do we do it? Well, you, um, you have an incubator where you incubate the eggs. And uh, this, on a big scale, can be a highly efficient process. Um, those eggs are then hatched, and these, these fingerlings are reared for a period of time in, in freshwater. They are then uh, go through a process of smultification that we mimic. We can use uh, various treatments to light regimes and adjustment of water parameters to, to to go get this process happening, smultification, so they're ready for salt water. Um, then they're transferred to sea. They are grown out to sea um, up to a, a slaughter size that can be anything from four to six kilos, you know, typically. And at that point, they're harvested and processed and end up on your dinner plate. Now, Marine Harvest is a, is a company that has <coughs> many brands. Um, maybe you, some of you are familiar with some of these brands of, of, of the product. Um, it's not just Atlantic Salmon. Marine Harvest is also involved in some, some other species uh, and product uh, uh, distribution of other species, but primarily it's salmon. And when I talk about breeding work and genomics, I'm only talking about salmon. Uh, Marine Harvest is, is the biggest producer of Atlantic salmon in the world. Um, it's represented across the world. Of course, we have markets across the entire world. Um, there's a very large turnover, and the harvest volume in 2016 was, was nearly 400,000 tonnes of, of salmon. So it's a significant uh, amount of fish being produced. There. <coughs> so why, why is a breeding program important to, a, to marine harvest? We're, we're a production company. We produce salmon and sell salmon. So why do we need to run a breeding program? Why don't we just buy eggs um, and grow up salmon? Well, well, what we know is we're fortunate in that basically all the important economic traits in Atlantic salmon have a significant genetic component. 
And these economic traits, well, I won't mention them all, but um, obvious traits like growth rate, very important, faster growth, less time at sea, more efficient. Feed conversion ratio, the quality of the product, um, good color, good, good, uh, good flesh quality. Disease resistance is now a very important trait. Um, there are many, many challenges out in the sea, many pathogens, parasites, and these are all very heritable, we see in our data. So we can do a lot with this in a breeding program. Having a breeding program for us means that we can access a stock of fish that they're, they're suited to our specific needs. So we can tailor the breeding program to what we want as uh, a fish to produce in our farms. And our farms have certain challenges and we want to produce fish to meet those challenges. It, um, it gives us control of the whole production cycle from egg to harvest. We also produce the feed, so we have the, we're a full production company in it. And having that full control of egg, egg to harvest is, is advantageous in many ways we see as a company. And, of course, it's also the marketing side. It, we have all these products, you see all these brands, um, but actually our breeding program is, is part of that brand. And maybe some of you have heard of Mui Salmon. Um, that's, that's our strain, actually. The Marine Harvest strain is the Mui, <coughs> <excuse me. coughs> the Mui strain, and that uh, has its origins back in the 1960s. So Marine Harvest has breeding programs um, across the world, mainly three, uh, three main really sites for, for when it comes to selective breeding work. Um, there's the Moi population in Norway. There are three, uh, well, three to four strains in Chile that we farm and, and run a breeding program for. And we have two strains in Canada that we have in a, in a local breeding program run in Canada. And yes, I won't spend much time on this, but this just shows that you know, within Europe, we, we also can supply eggs to, uh, to Scotland and the Faroe Islands from the Norwegian. Um, breeding program and Chile is, uh, is, is only producing eggs and, and uh, fish for Chile and likewise Canada is, is exclusively for Canada. So what do we breed for? Um, I mentioned some of the important economic traits before, growth rate being the, one of the most obvious, most important traits and the one that's been, been included in the breeding programs for, for the longest time. Um, of course, you remember since this began in the 60s, there were no genomics. There was no genomics back then. Um, breeding was much simpler, and growth was the natural trait to select for. Uh, as I mentioned, also quality traits. Um, here's the the flesh colour. Um, pink or red flesh is an important uh, phenotypic uh, quality for salmon. Um, some markets, especially, highly value this, um, and it's a heritable trait too. This is uh, two fish that have been um, suffering from a viral disease. So disease resistance not only kills fish, but it also results in um, significantly poorer quality. Uh, these fish are effectively runts now. They've stopped growing, and you can see the condition is, is quite terrible. And another major problem that the industry has is this little critter that's uh, lying on these fish here. A seemingly, yes, uh, innocuous little thing, but uh, a sea lice that costs the industry around five, probably between five and 10 billion Norwegian krona every year. So um, that is probably enemy number one for Atlantic salmon farming, the sea lice. So just a quick uh, overview of the history of the Marine Harvest Breeding Program. So it started in the 60s um, from basically eggs from two rivers, two river systems in Norway. For a period of time, for a significant period of time, there was just mass selection, very basic with control of inbreeding. Um, in 1999, this was changed to a family-based breeding program, which enabled, of course, a lot more sophistication in the, the breeding program work. And then we introduced QTL and genomic selection really from about 2012 onwards. And I think I'd like to say now from 2017, we've really gone transition to a full genomics in the breeding program. And so why genomics? Well, <laughs> we're animal readers here. We're hearing a lot about, um, of course, genomics these days. I don't need to say too much about why genomics. Obviously, the increase in accuracy of breeding values is an, one of the most obvious uh, results we can get from, from genomics in a breeding program. Um, don't I mention, of course, some of the other advantages, of course, of using genomics, some of the other effects, um, the, the byproducts in a way, and the other things that uh, it benefits uh, the breeding program. Um, but this is just a way to show, well, traditionally, if we had a, 
40 individuals from a single full sibling family in uh, a salmon family. If we had just a family breeding value, um, all those individuals would have the same breeding value. Uh, we don't have an individual breeding value on those because the, um, the family breeding value is all that uh, exists. However, if we look at the genomic level, uh, we had an individual genomic breeding value for all these individuals, uh, we see that of course there's a, a big range within that family. So not only does this mean that by using genomics we can select the best fish within the best families, we can also select a lot of good fish from families that would otherwise have had an average that was not particularly good. So the Atlantic salmon genome was sequenced in 2015, um, published uh, at that time. Uh, it was a significant and important resource for, for the, both for the research community and for um, the breeding companies, giving access, of course, to three billion bases of sequence, around 46,000 genes, and well, how many million SNPs? Probably tens of millions of SNPs. Um, this is a work in progress. This figure here shows the, a little bit of the complication of the salmon genome being an uh, ancestrally duplicated genome um, that is basically reverted back to diploidy. However, effectively, each um, chromosome is, is represented, uh, well, each chromosome is, is uh, duplicated in the genome. So you can see here where these straps are joining, that's um, effectively the same sequence. Uh, and that creates some challenges for uh, of course, for SNP genotyping. Uh, I won't talk too much about that, but uh, it's a complication that we have to deal with uh, with Atlantic salmon genomics. So a little bit about our use of, of axiom arrays in the breeding program. Uh, we started off in around 2013 with the first um, axiom array, which we call NOFCEL, um, collaboration between the Research Institute and FEMA and another breeding company, Selma Breed. Um, that was the 37K product, and we genotyped all together about 5,000 samples. So it was a small scale. It was a discovery, basically a discovery project of um, R&D, with the main focus on R&D. Uh, we followed up 2015 with the, the second version, where we pushed it up to a 57K array. And then we also together scaled that up to 20,000 samples. So we moved you know, one step further in the process. And from 2017, we had our third array, which was the NOFCEL 3 array another 57K array, uh, but the big difference here is that together we've scaled things up to 225,000 samples uh, in, in, in a commitment that we've made uh, in that purchase. Um, the obvious, we've, we've talked, heard a little bit about, of course, economy of scale is a very important thing here. Uh, we pay a lot less when we order 225,000 samples compared to 5,000 samples. So. There's a, there's a significant benefit in upscaling um, from the cost side as well. So how did we design these arrays? I won't spend too much time on this because I can see my clock is ticking down there. But basically the, the original NOFCEL array, we didn't have a, a salmon genome assembled in chromosomes. Um, so we basically mined uh, existing RNA-seq data that we had and selected what we thought were a polymorphic and um, informative SNPs focused more on coding regions, uh, if possible. So we used um, some typical parameters like uh, minor little frequency coverage and putative function to help us um, down select that set. We ended up with around 30K polymorphic high resolution SNPs. And that was a good starting point for us. We generated a lot of data from that and uh, it was a good uh, foundation for the next version. And so what we did here was we took the good SNPs from the previous array we now had a genome assembly assembled in chromosomes. So we mapped these SNPs across the chromosomes and we filled the empty, basically we filled the empty spots on the chromosomes with SNPs from the existing, uh, from, a, from the public uh, Axiom Salmon array, which is a commercial product offered by Thermo. So just to visualize that, we had SNPs, the orange SNPs here is the ones that we were able to map to the genome. And then uh, we filled in the gaps where we could with other polymorphic SNPs. Then we went to NOFCEL 3, pretty much the same process. We took the good SNPs from NOFCEL 2. Um, we found some additional other targeted SNPs that we generated through various R&D projects. Um, so we added those to the array. You heard from Donna how we can, of course, refine these arrays. So we just added a new set of SNPs. Um, we genotyped two more um, of the, the commercial salmon array. And again, we just did that same process of refinement of filling in bins. So here we had two SNPs that uh, didn't perform as well as we hoped. 
So we got rid of those and then just replaced them with two new good SNPs. So by the third iteration of this array, we're sort of getting to the point where it's, it's, we've got a really solid set of SNPs and it's, uh, it's very informative. So how is our analysis pipeline? Well, we have a lab we work with, um, a project tracing system. We send them samples. They extract and genotype and send us results. They do all the plate level QC work at the lab there. Uh, and then they upload the raw data uh, in terms of uh, cell files to their server and we download and do the following analysis. Um, we have a pretty efficient pipeline now for this. Um, I don't think I'll go into the details here, but it's uh, an APT pipeline on the Unix server and it does all the clustering genotype calling and we also have a, what we call a rescue step for basically recovering the good data from samples that just fall below that threshold. If we set a threshold of 97% and we have a sample that has 96.9% .9 call rate, if we were very strict, we'd lose that sample altogether. But we know there's a whole lot of good data in that sample. So we have this rescue step where we get the good data from that sample. And then we end up with producing some binary plink files in the output. Then we take that data and we do the various things. Um, analysis suites, of course, we run the usual things, sample QC, SNP QC. We apply our marker maps to the data. And then uh, we're at the applied level now for the breeding program where we're doing GBRE predictions and we're doing GWAS. And well, as you know, anyone who's worked with large volume SNP data, there's, a, there's an awful lot of stuff you can do um, within this data in addition. So it's a huge resource and we've generated, you know, 60, 70, 80,000 samples now in our data sets. So they're very, um, very significant. This pipeline is very fast now. We've got this down to the point where we can go from uh, raw data to GBVs in a day, basically. So I can download the cell files, run the pipeline, do GBLUP and have this data in a single day. And uh, why it needs to be that fast? Well, it doesn't always need to be that fast, but sometimes if we need a quick turnaround, if we have some fish that we have sampled and we need to get them on land at a certain time and pre-select them, then we need to do this quickly. And so this, this, this works, it works really well. Um, genomic selection, standard methods, we do it the same way as, as livestock breeders. Um, we have a reference population, for example, disease challenge test. We send a group of fish to a challenge, they get exposed to a disease, and we record the phenotype, dead, alive, or some other quantitative phenotype. Uh, we genotype them with the, the axiom array. We have our prediction equations. Um, I mentioned GBLUP, we also look at Bayesian models. We find that GBLUP works really well and we don't get a lot of additional benefit from the more complex models. Maybe that's something with the salmon population structure and the families that we have. Uh, we have our candidates and of course we genotype them and, and have a uh, breeding value, genome breeding value. So this is, this is not um, hugely different really from any other livestock uh, genomic selection. And it really works for us. I mean, we've, we've looked at this. We've got, um, now we've got, uh, of course, cross-validation. We've got some real validation data. But we get a really significant, substantial increase in breeding value accuracy across the board. I apologize, some Norwegian uh, words have snuck in here. But this is a viral disease. That's a viral disease. That's this sea lice. Um, fillet color and growth and weight. And you know, you see these are significant increases in accuracy. You know, and we see that across the board. So you know, we're really seeing an effective um, result coming out of this, this genotyping work now. And we're also finding QTLs. Now, if any of you were in the aquaculture session yesterday, you would have heard from Aquagen how um, you know, they've, they've spent a lot of resources and time, discovered significant QTLs, major QTLs, and have selected on these QTLs for a period of time and are seeing really good results. We're finding the same thing in our data, in our population. This is an example of a major QTL for a, for a viral disease. You um, obviously, those who are familiar with Manhattan plots, major, major effect here on chromosome. Huge difference between genotypes in, in mortality and survival. And you know, this is a trait that has been implemented for some years in the industry and has had a really positive effect on the number of outbreaks of that disease. Another QTL, another viral disease for us. Again, hard to see, sorry about that. Manhattan plots are always horrible to show, I think, on screens. but. At the end, we've got a major QTL here, another one here, and when you look at the, the fish with you know, four copies of the, the really weak allele, they had 94% mortality, and the fish that had four copies of the resistant allele at these two QTLs had only 25% mortality. So really significant effects here we're finding in these QTLs. I can see it's flashing at me now, so I'm gonna move on fairly quickly. 
We've also used this to, to verify what's called the puberty gene in salmon. This is a, a locus that, um, that controls basically age at maturity. Um, fish that mature after one sea winter, um, one mutation effectively controls this. Um, and this was discovered in, in, in wild populations and published in Nature, and we've also shown this in our um, breeding population. And this is some implications for um, the breeding program in terms of being able to screen out fish that will mature too early for us. Um, sex determination, there is a gene that controls sex in uh, determination in, in salmon called SDY. We also talked about in the aquaculture session yesterday. Simple and accurate sex determination, we have these probe sets on the array. Basically, when you detect the gene here, um, it's a male. When you don't detect it here, it's a female. So we draw this line here, these are male, these are females. This is really useful data on small immature fish that we can't sex and we want to, for example, split into males and females. It's not 100% and it's not because of the array, that's because of um, some weirdness in the salmon genome, which some of you know about. Um, but that's a, it's a very useful tool and it, it's kind of, we, it's included in the, in the array, of course, so it's, we get it as a bonus in a way for all the genotyping. So just to conclude then, I think this, this large-scale implementation of, of Axiom genotyping have transformed our breeding program. We went from, from this in a sort of an R&D perspective, looking at it, testing it, a few studies, then seeing that it worked and then basically deciding we'll go all in on this. And now basically all our breeding program revolves around uh, genomics uh, and all our breeding values are genomic breeding values. Um, we see really a good improvement in accuracy from genomic selection now. Um, I think all the salmon farmers, all the salmon breeding companies now working with this uh, get equally good results, so that's really positive. We're finding major QTL, another really useful thing for us because we can do some targeted genotyping and select on QTLs. Um, and the, 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 the axiom arrays, they're good. I mean, it works. Um, it's high throughput. We get very reproducible results. It's fast. Like I said, we can go from raw data to, to breeding values in a day. And um, that's what we need. You know, we need something that is, that is reliable. We have large numbers of samples coming from different places, different times. They need to go through a very standard pipeline and get reliable data. And our software and analysis pipelines, I think, have reached a good state of maturity and efficiency. And we get that, uh, we get that high, high throughput and speed, which is it's actually quite important for us. So thank you very much uh, for your attention.